Good evening. I'm pleased to welcome you here to our final, our third and final lecture with Dr. Mark Boda, who is the Professor of Old Testament at McMaster University. Uh, I, I don't think I need to introduce him formally. Most of you have been here for a few evenings, and perhaps you joined us for chapel today, where we had quite a, a lovely introduction by Dr. Kalaki. I want to just say some personal things, uh, what I've appreciated about uh, Dr. Boda, about his uh, lectures and, uh, and his actual his person. I have uh, a really appreciated the blend of fine scholarship and a pastoral heart. I said to my research uh, methods class this afternoon that he is a model for what I consider to be good Christian scholarship. Bring, uh, bridging that gap between the academy and the pew. So thank you for that. And also thank you for your appreciation of Christian education in the church. Um, our uh, talk this evening, our address, will be the creational pulse of Old Testament theology. And just one or two announcements before we invite him up. There still are just a few books left of After God's Own Heart, which is the Gospel According to David. And I understand that it, this makes a wonderful Bible study. There are uh, uh, study guides that go along with it. And that is a steal, I think, at $10. Um, and I will remind you once again to fill out the dreaded evaluation form. You only have to do it once, but please do it. So with that, welcome Dr. Boda. Thank you very much. It has been a delight to be here and to enjoy the fellowship of professors and students and people who have come to the conference, uh, lay people from churches, and uh, blessings upon you all. I'm uh, looking forward to this last, uh, last time together, and hopefully we'll draw some things together and connections into what we should do with our Old Testament theology. Let me begin by <coughs> reviewing a bit of, of last night. Uh, tonight's about the creational pulse of Old Testament theology. But let me just review quickly what I did last night. And in each case, I'm going to do some review to ramp you back up. And as for those who weren't here on previous days, that'll help us, help us catch, get you caught up and then move into some new, uh, some new material. Uh, we've been looking at the redemptive pulse of Old Testament theology. And last night I talked about three uh, kind of fundamental pulses that are found within the redemptive pulse. The narrative creed, what I called the narrative creed is that storied creed, that, that uh, the story of Israel at, that lies at the core of the faith of Israel. The character creed, Exodus 34, and the relational creed, the covenantal relational creed that is found throughout the Old, Old Testament. And tonight, I want to go back over these creedal centers, these narrative character and relational creeds, but I want to move them in the direction of the creational uh, dimension of Old Testament uh, theology. Something I didn't talk about last night, I focused attention in on the redemptive stream of Old Testament theology. So we're going to start with uh, the, the narrative creed. And uh, let me just start by just reviewing what we talked about last night. That in the Old Testament, uh, one way of encapsulating the theology of the Old Testament and of the Israelite faith was to encapsulate it within a storied form. That is, when someone was asked, and in particular uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a great example, when a father was asked a question by a child, the answer to the child in response came out in storied form. That is, uh, the, the reason for the Torah or for this teaching, and then a story is told about how God delivered the Torah to the people of God. In Deuteronomy 26 is another example when someone came to bring their first fruits on thanks, the thanksgiving of ancient Israel, and they were to present it before the priest, they were to recite their faith before the priest. Now, we might think of someone as reciting the Apostles' Creed or the, the Nicene Creed as they come in thanksgiving to God. But in this case, an Israelite was to come and to tell the story of their faith. My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt, but few in number, and on and on it went into the Exodus, etc., as they told the story in Deuteronomy 26. Uh, as, as, you look at, as you look at these passages, though, uh, one thing that, is, that was noticed by Old Testament theologians 
is that this encapsulation of faith grew over time into a longer and longer tradition complex that began with a very kind of a small and focused uh, recitation of tradition until it was very large, almost an an entire chapter uh, long. The structure that I talked about uh, of what is covered within these recitations of the narrative creed in the Old Testament uh, fall through the areas of ancestors, exodus, wilderness, conquest, land, and exile. The basic story of the Old Testament that you find today all the way from Genesis over to Second Kings as an example. The narrative creed at its very core though is the basic statement that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. And the actions in, in, that are common throughout the entire tradition of this narrative creed are these two. To bring out of Egypt by miracle, to bring into the land as a gift. And this is ca- encapsulated so nicely in Deuteronomy chapter 6, in which it speaks about the, the kind of the story of we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders against Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his household. And he brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land. This is kind of an encapsulated core, the two fundamental traditions, one the exodus coming out and the other the conquest uh, going in. The coming out of Egypt and the going in to the land become the very core of this theological creed, this pulse, this narrative creed or narrative pulse uh, within Old Testament uh, theology. Tonight I want to look at the creational dimension of the narrative pulse or creed that I introduced last night. That is, the narrative creed not only confesses the redemptive action of God, but it also confesses the creational action of God. A great passage to see this in is in Nehemiah chapter 9. As some of you have heard, this is one of my favorite passages. It was the focus of my dissertation work, and it was where I first came in contact with the depth of this creation, this, this, this narrative creed, the storied creed, which for me was very new as I moved into Old Testament studies to see faith expressed through these, these actions of God, the story of God, which should not have shocked me. What lies at the core of the New Testament is the gospel. It's a story. And the Old Testament is so filled with story. But it was somehow odd to me because for me, theology was to be given in abstracts, the, God, the, the various attributes of God. But what is interesting is that at the beginning of Nehemiah 9, which is a long recitation, and as Von Rod said, as I said last night, is this massive and the most developed of all the narrative creeds of the Old Testament, that at the very beginning of it, though, there is this dimension of creation, in which as they begin to pray to God in the Persian period, they say, Arise, bless the Lord your God forever and ever, Oh, may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is, in, that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and the heavenly host bows down before you. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out up from Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. And on the story goes to talk about Moses, the rising of Moses, the Exodus experience, the giving of the Torah, the wilderness experience, the going into the land, then the the rebellion in the land, and the tension of the prophets confronting the people. It's the grand story. But in this, of the many narrative creeds, this one begins with this focused attention in on the creational aspect. Before they get to, you are the Lord God, which is found in the fourth last line, they first say, you alone are the Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth. So at the outset, there is this creational aspect, this creational pulse that is found, and you can see in the yellow on the chart, not in the earlier, what Von Rod considered the earliest of these, 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 narrative, these narrative creeds, but in the later ones, as you move down into Psalm 135 and 136, Jeremiah 32 and Nehemiah 9, then you start to see how creation is placed clearly at the outset to bring, in a sense, to connect that redemptive story into a broader, a broader story that includes creation as well as a component at the start of that story. So it's not just in Nehemiah 9, which is the example I gave you, but Jeremiah 32 also has the same, the same dimension placed at the very outset. 
in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah will be praying to God and crying out to him. He will talk about life in the land. He will talk about the, about the exodus from Egypt. But before he gets there, he focuses attention on this. All Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. See, long before he gets to, you brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders and with a strong hand, with outstretched arm and with great terror. He first says, just as in Nehemiah 9, that you are the Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. So also in Psalms 135 and 136, key Psalms later in the, in the final book of the Psalter, we find this emphasis at the beginning of a long recitation of the story of Israel. We find this aspect of the, the creation. So before they get to the exodus from Egypt, we hear these words in Psalm 135, verse 5, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deeps, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, who brings forth the wind from his treasures, treasuries. We see here how the Lord is identified not only as the creator now, but also as the one who is the sustainer of creation, who continues to sustain the created world. So also in one, Psalm 136, before again they get to the exodus from Egypt, we hear those that are praying say, to him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights, the sun to rule by day, the moon and stars to rule by night, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And then they begin with the story of Exodus. We see in this later, these later materials in Psalm 135, in 136, in Nehemiah 9, in Jeremiah 32, we see this emphasis upon creation now at the outset of the story of the narrative creed, pushing us from a redemptive pulse to a creational pulse. This is seen in other contexts of the Old Testament, even beyond those that I've put up here on the screen. In Psalm 89, one of the most famous Psalms related to the Davidic house, which lays out the whole calling of David, the choice of David, the covenant that God made with David, and the frustration of the time of the exile as the Davidic king was off in exile. At the beginning, before they get to review the story of David and God's choice of David and God's covenant with David, they begin with a long section related to creation and to God as that creator of the earth. This is expanding and expanding as we move into the exilic period. So also Psalms 104 to 106, Psalm 105 and 106 are very long Psalms. They relate the whole redemptive story of Israel. But it's interesting that in the final form of the Psalter, as the Psalter is put together into its final form that we have today, here at the end of book four, Psalm 104 now is placed very carefully before Psalm 105 and 106. And Psalm 104 in that arrangement focuses its complete attention upon God as creator, and God as sustainer of the universe. It thus is very carefully placing the creational aspect just prior to the redemptive aspect, the creational pulse before the redemptive pulse. This helps us make sense of a whole load of material that's found in the Old Testament. And it's seen in Genesis 1 to 11, for instance, that the great primary history, at the beginning of that history, the story of Israel, which many might think that an ancient people would start with the story in with Abraham, right? Genesis chapter 12. But that's not where the story begins. The story begins with Genesis 1 to 11. In many ancient Near Eastern peoples, the creation of the first human being is that human being which is the founder of the nation. But not within Israel's story. Israel's story has Genesis 1 to 11 in the first spot. So at the outset of the primary history, it places the context of the story of redemption, which begins in earnest carefully with Genesis 12, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It places that story in a much larger creational context that's very important for the story of Israel. Even in what is often called the second primary history, the first primary history is sometimes called David Noel Friedman, called Genesis to 2 Kings, 
the primary history, the first primary history. He saw that all as one collection. There's been lots of debate about whether that is one collection or not. But Genesis to 2 Kings being the primary history, the book of Chronicles, which comes at the very end of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, takes us from Adam, the first word in the book, in the genealogy, down to the Persian period and the return from exile. Thus, it also, in a sense, mimics the primary history. It starts from the beginning, from creation, with Adam, using names to do this, and it ends with the return from exile. In a sense, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, is surrounded by these two primary histories, these two stories. Interestingly, that both stories begin with creation, with Genesis 1 to 11, at least in one case, with all the names that are found in Genesis 1 to 11. This creational impulse and understanding of the creational impulse helps us to make sense of the wisdom tradition, which I said in our, in our, sec, or in our first time together has been very difficult for Old Testament theo theologians to fit into their systems. Wisdom literature is so focused upon creational values and wisdom literature fits beautifully into this creational pulse of Old Testament theology. We'll come back to that at the end of our time together. And even within prophecy, although prophecy is so carefully focused upon the redemptive story, on redemption, on calling people to faith, calling people back in repentance to, to the Lord, even within prophetic material, there is the sense of looking forward, isn't there? Towards the new heaven, towards the new earth, towards some kind of a new creation. There's a creational impulse within the prophetic literature itself. What we see then in the Old Testament is not only a narrative creed that confesses the redemptive action of God, but also one that confesses the creational action of God. Last night, we also looked at the character creed, the second major pulse that moves throughout the entire body of the Old Testament. The character creed, redemptively, is confessing the redemptive character of God. And I introduced you to Exodus 34, 6 to 7, and the way in which it sets the tone for a repeated recitation of, the, of a certain theological core of Israel's faith, which focuses attention not upon story, not upon finite verbs, but rather upon adjectives, nouns, participles. It talks about characteristics of God, and Exodus 34, 6 to 7 was my prime example for this type of a creedal center or pulse. At its very core, as seen in Exodus 34, 6, is the statement, the Lord, the Lord, the unpacking of Yahweh's name, which was the promise at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. And as the Lord passed before Moses, this was proclaimed and this becomes a revelatory little piece, little nugget of the faith of Israel. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We look throughout the Old Testament at a load of different examples in which this character creed found in Exodus 34 is repeated. We hear the echoes throughout the Old Testament. And we saw how this full form, in a sense, is very full in Exodus 34 and in Numbers 14. But we saw that as it progresses throughout the Old Testament, that it, in a sense, is encapsulated down to those first four characteristics that are found in Exodus 34. Those are all adjectives and nouns. All the rest are participles. And I said last night how these core redemptive attributes of, of Yahweh are then unpacked in those participles that follow. That is, that at the very core are these characteristics of covenant faithfulness that work themselves out in both positive and negative ways in the participles that follow. And we saw how those core, those core four values were merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Well, tonight I want to look at the character creed as also confessing the creational character of God. That there is a revelation in the Old Testament that runs alongside the redemptive revelation of Yahweh that focuses attention upon him as creator. It is not as dominant, I will say, as the redemptive character, as it is the redemptive character is articulated throughout the Old Testament. But it clearly is there. In books especially like the book of Isaiah, there's a great focus of attention in the wisdom books upon Yahweh's character as the creator God. He is seen as creator, Kone. He is the maker, Ose. Notice the amount of, 
of, uh, of wisdom books that are included within this use of the term for, for, for the Lord. He is the poel, he is the maker in Job 36.3, the creator bore within Ecclesiastes Isaiah, and Isaiah. He is the maker, yotzer. We're using the same words in English, but these are all different words within the Hebrew text. And these are participles that are identifying God's role and God as the primary mover within, within the creation of the world. He is not just the redeemer, but he is the creator. He is the Lord who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, especially favorite within the book of Isaiah and the prophetic material. And he is the maker of heaven and earth. He is the maker of all things. You see, the God who is the redeemer is identified clearly as the God who is the creator. His identity as creator is key throughout the Old Testament as the Israel as the foundation for Israelite polemic against idolatry. But it also appears throughout wisdom literature as the sages reflect on God's creation and human culture. God as creator was essential to the wisdom tradition. Now, I would say that there are certain people that say that the wisdom tradition is somehow completely separate from the redemptive prophetic tradition. That is, that the, the, the wisdom tradition is not interested in salvation history or redemption. But I, almost like a secular type of a approach to, to the world or theology. I would say no. I think at the very foundation of wisdom literature is this fundamental redemptive theology that's seen in this phrase that appears in all the wisdom books, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, as Moshe Weinfeld, I think, has shown, is clearly tied to the book of Deuteronomy, where it is found over and over and over and over, in which it refers to the basic faith commitment, the awe of Israel before their God, in worship before him. It is that, that point of submission of the fear of the Lord, which then is the beginning of wisdom. So what we see in wisdom literature actually is foundationally because of the redemption as I enter into covenant relationship with the Lord, with Yahweh, now in the, in the, in, founded in that fear of the Lord relationship, uh, we see now reflection on the Lord as creator and all of the beauty of creation around us and of culture. I'll talk about that a bit later as we get to the end of our time together. Yahweh is then the creator but Yahweh is also identified throughout the Old Testament, as we've already seen in some of the narrative creeds, as the sustainer. He's the one that doesn't just begin this. This is not the great clockworker, right? This is not the great uh, deistic God who set things in motion and then went off for a holiday. This God is the creator God who begins the process and continues to sustain the process of history and breaks into the midst of history with redemptive actions, but also is all about us in, in creation, caring for creation and sustaining creation. The best example of this, of course, is the book of Job, which focuses attention upon God as the sustainer of the universe. Job 38, for instance, and 39, focus great attention on Yahweh as the sustainer, as creator of the universe. So what we see in, in, in the Old Testament is not only on the one side, uh, Yahweh as the redemptive character, but also Yahweh as the creational character within the Bible, the creator. Thirdly, last night we looked at the redemptive pulse of the Old Testament in terms of the relational creed, that third major pulse that moves throughout the Old Testament that we can feel wherever we go within the body parts of the Old Testament. That is that the Old Testament relational creed confesses the redemptive relationship with God. This is that at very core, we can find it you know, moving right throughout all the different parts of the Old Testament. And each one of these weave their way through the various genres and sections, the corpora of, Old Test of the Old Testament canon. This relational creed at its very core has these basic uh, covenants, as we often call them within Old Testament studies or New Testament or biblical studies. And they have these basic qualities, similar scope, promises, stipulations, sign, and phases. And we walked just very quickly through the aspects of Abrahamic, Sinaitic, priestly, and Davidic covenants last night. And we saw at its very core is this basic rhythm. This very core is, I will be your God and you will be my people. 
And with the Davidic covenant, I will be for him as a father. He will be for me as a son. We saw that, that the, at the very core of these qualities of reciprocity, that covenant relationship means relationship. That is a two-way street. It's a back and forth. Now, I would say that, that covenants on one level are unilateral. There's always a debate. Are covenants unilateral or bilateral? That is, are they a one-way street or a two-way? Is it all about God reaching out? Or is it about God reaching out and humanity reaching back? I would say that all covenants are unilateral in the sense that God always takes the first move in covenant relationship. He's the one who reaches out throughout the redemptive story. But they're bilateral in the sense that every one of the covenants expects reciprocity. It expects there to be a response from humanity. In each case, we saw how there's a status To be your God is the status of God in this relationship. To be his treasured people is the status of people. And there's a responsibility. It's not that some some of the covenants don't have responsibilities. Some are law versus grace. All of them require response. The Davidic covenant requires response. Abrahamic required response. It is not just a one-way street. It is bilateral in terms of responsibility, and that responsibility is for God as he gives himself to us and says that he will set you high above all the nations that he has made and also requires a response to walk in his ways to keep his statutes and his uh, commands. But we also see how, in terms of the relational creed, how we see not only a redemptive dimension, but a creational dimension that we see in the Old Testament that there is a creational pulse to the relational creed, confessing the creational relationship with God. That Yahweh is also designated as creator, and the the place I go is the Noachic covenant in Genesis chapter 9. Genesis 9, 1 to 7, arises out of the sinfulness of humanity, yes. This covenant arises out of God's displeasure with the wickedness of all humanity in Genesis 6. Yet in the midst of this, Noah found favor, we're told, in the eyes of the Lord. He's described as a righteous one, blameless among the people of his time who walked with God. Last night, we talked about the four foundational covenants within Israel's redemptive pulse. But tonight, I add a fifth covenant, one that precedes these covenants with Israel. It also has a quality, which is olam. That is, it is enduring. Just as the others are enduring, that is, there is no end in sight, so also this fifth covenant is identified as being in perpetuity as Olam. It is global, though, in contrast to the more national types of scope that we see within the other redemptive covenants. In terms of stipulations, those are laid out for us in chapter chapter 9, and there is a sign, as the others all have a sign, there is a sign, it is the sign of the rainbow. It is promised in Genesis 6.18, and I noticed I didn't say this last night, but every one of these covenants, these relational creeds, every one of them is foreshadowed by a promise first. Genesis 12 is not a covenant, it's a promise. And the covenant then comes in two phases often. In this case with Noah, we only have the one phase where it's formalized in chapter 9, verses 9 to 11. Now how does the Noahic covenant relate to these redemptive covenants. There is a distinction because the Noachic covenant is with all humanity. These redemptive covenants are focused attention in on the Abrahamic, Isaac, and, the, and especially the Israelite contexts. That is, they are focused in on this redemptive line that will flow through history and bring redemption to all creation. But this covenant, this covenant is with all of humanity through Noah and his three sons who are forebears of all nations according to Genesis chapter 10. So there's a distinction then in this relationship to the redemptive covenants in that they are, this is focused upon all humanity. It seems to focus on all of creation. But there is a similarity as you see in the chart. Just as Abrahamic and Davidic and the priestly and the Sinaitic all focus attention on promising something related to the land and to seed, so also the same rhythm can be seen. There is a promise of seed, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth, and promise of land that they are filling the earth. 
the land in Genesis 9, verse 1. The need for Abraham, though, will be emphasized through the Tower of Babel story in Genesis chapter 11. So there is a relationship to the redemptive covenants, but that seems to stand out from them and be distinct from them, especially in the connection to all of humanity and all of creation. It also has a relationship to the creational story that precedes it, and this is the most important of all. Genesis 8 tips us off to the fact that the flood narrative is being depicted as a return to Eden, as a return to the first creation. The creation story in Genesis 1 structures creation in two phases. Out of chaos, tohu wabohu, formless and empty some say, formless and fillless some say, in Genesis 1-2, we find the ruach, the spirit, some would say, of God hovering over the waters. And God brings form on days one to three, creating light and darkness as basic principles, expanse between upper and lower waters, earth, sea, and vegetation, creates the form in Genesis chapter one, verses three to 10. And then secondly, on days four to six, in, in the next section, then fills this form. Basic principle related to Genesis chapter one. Places in the light and darkness, sun and moon, places in the expanse between the upper and lower waters, the water and sky, and, and, and then within earth, sea, and vegetation, the creatures and animals. And on day seven, in Genesis one, God creates humanity, male and female, blesses them and says, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. In light of that review of Genesis chapter one, which most of you probably got through and you're reading through the Bible in one year and can remember, there is a reversal of creation in Genesis chapter seven. Never notice this in Genesis seven, verse 11. It says, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. It says that water came up from underneath and water began to fall from above. The expanse that had been created in Genesis chapter one on day two was now being dissolved, wasn't it? And water was now coming down and water was coming up from beneath. And ultimately in Genesis chapter seven, verse 19, it says they rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered thus reversing day three of Genesis one, where earth and sea distinctions were erased. This then caused a reversal of the fill of land and sky animals in 722, where it says everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. We see then a reversal of creation in Genesis chapter seven, in the midst of this Noachic account. What then happens in Genesis eight can only be understood as a new creation. In Genesis chapter eight, verses one to three, when I read these words, and in most English translations, you don't pick up the connectivity back to Genesis one because of the translation. It says in Genesis chapter eight, verses one to three, he sent a ruach over the earth. Now there was a ruach, a spirit of the Lord, over the earth, over the waters, in Genesis chapter one. We know Genesis one, verse two. But Genesis 8 verse 1 says that he again sent a ruach, most English translations translate it as a wind over the earth. It's the same term that was used back in Genesis chapter 1. And it says that the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed. Thus there was again a new expanse between the upper and lower waters. And the water receded steadily from the earth until the earth was completely dry thus repeating the creational order of earth versus water within Genesis chapter one. This ends when Genesis 9, one, which says be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. It's a new commission. The same that was given to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter one is now given to Noah and to his family. Thus Noah's story is pivotal, pivotal in the story of humanity it acts as a bridge between the original creation in Genesis 1 and the new creation in Noah. But why? This is linked to the fact that the covenant, as I talked about today earlier, is a redemptive category. That is, that covenant is needed to structure the relationship ruptured by sin. The intimacy in the garden was a relationship unhindered by sin. 
I would say that there is no covenant in the garden, though there's some in this room and others that I know who have argued with me over this very point. But the language of Berit, covenant, is not used within Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It appears for the first time in the Noachic covenant, where now a covenant is made. That is an agreement with obligations between God and humanity. It is a redemptive category, but the Noachic covenant, which now is that covenant at the very outset of the story of humanity, is placed there to show that God has covenant not just with Israel, not just with this redemptive community that's gonna bring this amazing gift into the world of redemption, but has a covenant with the Noachic community, that is every nation on earth. There is a hope of a renewed Noachic covenant. Isaiah talks about it in a couple of places throughout the Old Testament. So last night we talked, we tracked the redemptive pulse of Old Testament theology, encapsulated in three theological creeds that I focused on. And tonight we've tracked the creational pulse of Old Testament theology, ways in which the three dominant theological creedal formulations, these pulses, beat a creational pulse. This quick review of creational motifs within the three foundational creeds of Old Testament theology reminds us that redemption serves creation. And we see this in, the new, in its, re, its relationship to New Testament theology, which has been important in all of our nights together. That is that Jesus is identified as a redeemer. But before he is given to us as a redeemer, in the Gospel of John, for instance, he is identified as the creator and as the sustainer of the universe. I find it very fascinating. John chapter one begins by identifying the word as with God, as the word as being part of the creation, the creation activity of God. I find it very fascinating. At the very end of the Gospel of John, in John chapter 20, verse 22, as Jesus appears in the midst of the apostles after his resurrection, and there's this funny scene, this uncomfortability and this fear that happens, and then Jesus looks at them and he says, the writer John says, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I've always looked at that as an Old Testament scholar and thought immediately of Genesis chapter two, where Yahweh God took humanity and breathed the breath of life into humanity and they came to life right? They became a living being, it says in Genesis chapter 2. See, John 1 says he is the creator, and the one who redeemed by his death and resurrection, his ascension, returns and comes again as Yahweh the creator to breathe new life and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1, 15 to 20 is another classic text, probably an early church creed related to Jesus's creational abilities. Jesus is also the founder of a new humanity. Throughout the New Testament, the motif of Christ as the image of God is rampant. And the motif of Christ as a second Adam cannot be ignored throughout New Testament theology. So this creational theme is essential and is focused in on the person of Christ, who not only comes as the recreator, the one who was creator is the recreator, but is the one who comes now as also that very new humanity. As God and human together, he now is the new humanity that raises, rises to life and brings the ability for the image of God and shows forth the image of God that was so key to the creation of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter one. And thirdly, Christians as a new creation. Christians as the renewed image of God. Not only does Jesus reflect the image of God from the creational accounts, but so also we as Christians are able to live in the renewed image of God to fully realize our humanity as those that are recreated by the Spirit of God, by the breath of God. Christians as a new creation. We are new creatures in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And Christians also as catalysts, as first fruits of the new creation in Romans 8. As it says that the creation groans for the appearance of the children of God. And now that they have appeared, there is this excitement 
uh, within creation because of the revelation of the children of God. Of course, in New Testament theology, we end the entire canon with Revelation 21 and 22, which shows us that the telos, the goal, the ultimate purpose, the end of the cosmos of creation is the end of the story of redemption. It's not simply redemption, but ultimately it's about a recreation. So what do we do with this now? In terms of my agenda for Old Testament theology, because of its authoritative character, how does it speak into our lives, into the cultural horizon? We've spent lots of time on the scriptural horizon, but this cultural horizon, how does it feed into us theologically to transform the way we think about the world and we act in the world and we are in the world, knowing, being, and doing? Well, redemption, first of all, I want to make clear at the end, is core to the gospel. We live in a fallen world that needs the transforming message of God's redemption, ultimately expressed through Jesus Christ. That is the proclamation of the redemptive story of God, the redemptive character of God, and the redemptive relationship with God. That is the message that we saw last night so clearly. And it is the dominant, it is the largest portion of the biblical message. It thus lies core to biblical theology. But key to understand is that redemption is not an end in itself, but rather it is a means to an end. That is, to restore humanity to their place as image bearers of God, enjoying relationship with God and with all creation. This means that the gospel ultimately has cultural and creational implications. The church should not be in flight from creation and culture, but rather engaging it, transforming it, and leading the way as image bearers of God. As restored image bearers, we are enabled to enjoy God's creation and explore human culture as no one else on earth. Often we focus on redemptive categories and redemptive themes. And there's a reason why we do that. Because the majority of the Bible is about redemption. Largely Genesis 12 to Revelation 20 is about redemption. It's the dominant story within the Bible. But I think we need to distinguish between majority and ultimate purpose. That is, it appears to me that while redemption is essential for the realization of creational transformation, it is creational transformation that is the main purpose. For me growing up, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, lay at the core of my call as a person. As a Christian, that was the main focus of attention. And rightfully so within a denomination that was committed to mission and to missionary service. But it was early in my college degree, sitting under a Christian professor, that I became aware of something odd beast called the cultural mandate. That is, that call of God to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1 to subdue the earth, to be involved in the earth, to engage the earth, and to fill the earth, what is often called the cultural mandate in Genesis 1. The Great Commission, I believe, has as its destiny the cultural mandate, that the spread of the gospel has as its destiny the transformation of the cosmos, of all creation. And as pastors and the church, we need to work out the implications of this for our ministries, that our people are not there to only staff our Great Commission efforts, but we are there to equip our people to fulfill the cultural mandate to be transformative influencers within culture and creation. You see, the creation, both physical and social, that's creation and culture, groans, groans for the revelation of the children of God who have been redeemed. Thus, while the majority of the Bible is about redemption, and redemption lies at the very core of our hope, it is the telos of the Bible that it begins with creation and it ends with new creation. And along the way, we are given these nudges in wisdom literature, for instance, which pushes us out of the comfort zone of redemptive categories to begin to think about how we can engage culture how we can be kings and leaders, 
how we can work within families, how we can think about the difficult things of life as Ecclesiastes does or Job does. That is that the wisdom literature in a sense gives us this perspective towards all of creation. And it is not absent from the Pauline epistles as Paul seems to push us forward towards the transformation of this world and of culture and to engage that culture. As pastors, I believe, and those that are in the room that are studying that direction, it is important for you to develop a, a sense of the cultural mandate of a broader theological agenda that it helps people to engage what it means to live the other six days during the week and to be more than just those that will come and give at my church, but actually that person that I will send forth empowered by strong messages of, of, of uh, empowerment of the spirit to enter into the workforce, to work into various fields of the world. And so that when they walk throughout, they don't think that they're, they're only, they're only part of their Christian faith is what happens there on Sunday morning but actually they are transformative influencers wherever they go within our culture. I mean, this reminds us finally of the key common ground of the image of God that exists between the church, between Christians and those that don't know Christ. That there is this common image of God, this connectivity that we have with those around us, that we share in common ground with all humanity, to interact with all humanity, to be engaged in all with all humanity in cultural and creational activity prior to the manifest rule of Christ on earth. The creational pulse of Old Testament theology seen in this triple pulse of the narrative, the character, and relational creeds, this is, I believe, the heart of the Old Testament. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, again for a stimulating lecture. Um, I'm enjoying this very much. Okay. So. Are there questions from the audience? And I will remind you, uh, questions and not lectures. We've had our lecture for the evening, and so we'll, we'll just ask questions. Yes. Thank you very much. We'll wait for the... <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, I was fascinated by your uh, reflection upon the covenants. Um, and are the covenants um, that are spoken of in the Old Testament truly um, a kind of bipartisan covenant where God's entering into some relationship with them um, in which they have any, a kind of meaningful response um, where they can affect their, in a real sense, their sort of their own redemption? Or are they more pointers and types of a bigger covenant which is in Jesus later on and in which case do they themselves speak to the salvation of God's people only through Jesus? I knew I was going to be in trouble with you in light of your doctoral work on covenant of grace. And, um, I, I, on, the, on the surface level, they expect response, whatever that means, fully. It's interesting to me that that Jesus, I mean, sorry, Paul does say in Romans 10 that the righteousness that comes through faith, that kind of righteousness, is mentioned in Deuteronomy. He quotes from Deuteronomy to do that. Um, that says to me that he saw something in terms of the ability to respond. And this may help us understand what is often called true Israel, of there it really is this there's a faithful core that really did fully experience relationship with Yahweh in that sense, being able to respond through actual works to God. It's interesting to me that often people, and this comes out in Chris Wright's work on, on ethics, in Old Testament ethics, that we often focus upon Ab the Abrahamic covenant on Genesis 15. When we get to Genesis 17, it's a bit of a problem because now it is certainly bilateral where as for you, as for me kind of thing, but then when you get to Genesis 22 and you get the Akedah and he actually goes through this faith testing, right at the end of it, there's this little piece that's often called the Deuteronomic insertion. And that Deuteronomic piece talks about Abraham in terms of someone who fulfilled the, co the commandments, who actually responded to God in, in following Torah. 
that is buried in many evangelical circles because our focus is on Genesis 15. There actually is an indication that Abraham is being honored here because of his response and covenant relationship to, uh, to Yahweh. It's very interesting that, and this might relate to what you're talking about, when we get to Nehemiah 9, oh, I'll bring it up again, to Nehemiah 9, and this was really kind of shocking when I first was working through this passage, uh, that very first passage that you saw the, last, the first verse of it, he chose Abraham, it says, and he says he found his heart faithful, and then it says, and he basically made commitment to give him the land. So in that rendition of the Abrahamic tradition, Abraham becomes this figure of obedience, this faithful figure. You know the old faith of Christ, what's the, what's the, what's the, uh, what's, what's the genitive there, objective, subjective? Is it faith in Christ or the faith that Christ actually produces for us? This is in a case where in Nehemiah 9, it appears that Abraham is being viewed as a founder, a fountainhead of faith who secures this relationship with the pe- for the people of God with the land forever. And thus he almost becomes, I would call this typological in the sense that you're talking about, that this faithful response of Abraham in, in Genesis 15 to 17 and 22 actually becomes just as Christ's faithful action becomes the foundation for our faith. But there still is that covenantal response, but I could see it typological in that sense, if that's what you mean. Typology. Over here. Thanks again, Dr. Boda. Um, You said uh, that you distinguish between the uh, command to be multi be fruitful and multiply in, in Genesis 9 and in Genesis 1. Um, and, and maybe you could just briefly uh, s- restate what you had shared today at the talk back session about how covenant was uh, reestablishing a relationship. And, and w- in, in light of that, what do you think Luke means when he refers to Adam as the son of God? E- exactly what I said today. Okay, that fits exactly, it's my opinion, that fits exactly what we have today in terms of my comment today was, and this is related to a larger debate over the covenants, which is a real problem when you live within and did forays within reform circles like Westminster, where John Murray talked about covenant of works and covenant of grace, and it becomes really dicey to say, you know, the covenants start with Noah. And I know when I wrote this book, in, in After God's Own Heart, even, um, you'll see Phil Riken, uh, who's a famous reform figure in the United States he endorses it, but he did have a problem with my comment about the covenant. So in a footnote, I kind of do a little bit of debate and try to soften things for him. But um, my comment this afternoon was that uh, covenants on the human level seem to occur not between family members, that is not between a father and a son. But covenants in the Old Testament on the human level that we see the examples occur between a husband and a wife, okay, which are not family members, right? These are, these are extra clan members. So it, it is the relationship of two families, or Abraham and Abimelech, they make a covenant. That's two clans that are coming together. Okay, it's not, they're not family members. That I don't have a covenant with my father as a son, as a child, that is a natural relationship. That there's, you don't have to make a deal. Okay, son, here's the deal. It was assumed this is a natural relationship. You will be in relationship with me. We don't cut deals. We don't set out rules, okay? So covenant by its very character, because of those human relationships, appears to be a cross-clan and non-natural in the sense of not inter-family relationships. Uh, Why do you need those relationships? Because I think sin is the key to the whole characteristic of this. You need to cut a deal because you need to identify what are the, what is the realm of this relationship, okay? Uh, what will be the stipulations for this relationship assumes there might be problems in this relationship. And so a covenant by its very character appears to be related, in my opinion, to a need for a redemptive context where you need to establish the relationship or reestablish. Thus Adam as son of God would fit right into that as one who is in the image of God. This, this approach to the image of God is actually being studied by one of my doctoral students uh, on the the role of image of God and image. Image is often interpreted in Old Testament theology as related to idolatry, 
because it's the same term thelem that's used for idols and images. But here's this image, and people say, oh, that's kind of wild, God has an image. Huh, here's the one image that's allowed, it's humanity. And although that may be somehow in place some parts of Old Testament theology, the student is working on the way in which in Genesis chapter five, it says that Seth is made in the image of Adam. And he's trying to unpack how image is actually a kinship term, a kinship category. Now don't go off and write a dissertation on him before he's finished, okay? But that this is a kinship category. So son of God is kinship, right? And it's related to the image, the image stuff back in Genesis chapter one. We have time for another couple of questions. There's a question at the back, Danny. Right at the very end of your lecture, you talked about what you just started talking about now of, of uh, being created in the image. And uh, I just want, and that kind of, I was waiting for you to talk about that when you're talking about the creational pulse. <coughs> and uh, I'm wondering what you think of, it seems to be an emphasis, or maybe it's a renewed emphasis or whatever, but I hear a lot about total depravity such that humanity became this worthless character in God, you know, in God's eyes. It almost, I hear this kind of talk and I just wonder, is that really the case when we're in the image and given the, the creational pulse that continues through the Old Testament? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can truly see the struggle about uh, image of God and total depravity in the reformed tradition of apologetics, for instance. And uh, when you work in, in a certain context of apologetics, certain reformed circles of apologetics, which, which is where a lot of apologetics happens actually, yeah, let's say the, the Gerstner and Sproul approach in which you actually do engage the evidentialist approach you know, from the medieval period using those evidentialistic arguments those assume some ability to interact with someone who's not a believer. Thus, it, it, it speaks of almost a noetic element, a, a mind element in the image that we can still communicate with. As opposed to, let's say, a presuppositionalist approach, let's say like Cornelius Van Til, possibly, who was one of my father's mentors back in the 60s, that, that presuppositionalist approach comes at the image of God in a very tenuous way. It says, if you take total depravity seriously, there's a sense in which every th way that that person thinks, that is, there is not just a fall in some moral way, there's a noetic fall that people's minds are depraved and they can't even think outside the box of their fallenness and the depravity. This causes a real problem because how do you actually speak to somebody who's not a believer who sits within that presuppositional system? And he still talks about in his apologetics books about the image of God as being key to this, but I've never totally figured out how the image of God is part of this, that it's almost like we emanate the image of God somehow. At the end of the day, in a presuppositionalist apologetics, you have to, in a sense, just ask the person, come and try out my presupposition system and see how it works but I'm not sure how that relates to that image of God that I think is, is underplayed within that presuppositional apologetic, that there really is something of the image of God truly that we can interact with that does occur on the level of soul on even the level of the mind that occurs. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like and I take seriously the fact that we do have presupposition systems that can kibosh any argument or any conversation with somebody but there still is that ability to converse and I see it in practice over and over. And I would say that is part of that image of God is that sense of the godness within, but it's also within the mind itself. Question back here. Hi, just in relation to uh, the redemptive pulse of the Old Testament, I'm curious your thoughts on uh, a Christocentric reading of the Old Testament versus like a Christotelic reading. Um, recently I saw a book title called Jesus on Every Page. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. There seems to be an emphasis, re-emphasis on that today. What are your thoughts on... Uh, yeah, I talked about this last night a little yeah, bit. I think I did, didn't I? Maybe not. Maybe it was here. I don't know where it was now. Maybe it was at McDonald's. Who knows? Talk back. Maybe it was. And I, I did, I, I used to talk about crystal centricity. I think last night I talked about 
my hermeneutic for doing biblical theology is that the Bible is theocentric, Christotelic, and pneumomorphic. And that was my Trinitarian hermeneutic. And my focus was on, yes, the, the Bible is about God, and we should not lose God in the midst of this book. But secondly, one of my problems with crystal centricity, I mean, you can continue to use that term, but the problem is it often ends up with this Jesus behind every bush, Jesus is in, is in the red thing here, or the tree in that story, or the light stand in that story, or whatever, as opposed to crystallicity, which looks to then, Christ is the ultimate destination of the story. Christ is the ultimate destination of this pattern or whatever it may be. But I don't have to find Jesus behind some rock in the book of Ruth, but I can talk about the way in which the book of Ruth sets up certain patterns, deep theological patterns, or the way in which even the book of Ruth, in a, in a sense, moves the story of redemption one step on that's pushing forward towards Jesus. That is part of Christotelicity. I don't have to find Jesus behind one of the genealogies here, but I can say that in a sense, this genealogy is heading that way towards that destination. That really frees things up that any passage in a sense is moving us forward in redemptive history. But I wanna add that extra piece that I think is underdeveloped within the reform tradition in particular that I was involved with for a few years. And it is this, pneumomorph or this pneumomorphic dimension. That is that often we kind of stopped at proclaiming Christ and we didn't go to that next step that Paul, I think um, Gordon Fee, for instance, and in all his work in Pauline work has pushed forward towards the importance of the spirit within the Pauline literature. So we focused on in him, in Christ, and that's important, that's a foundational. But we don't go to that next step to say, actually, it's not just the past event of Christ's death and resurrection, but it is the indwelling spirit that enables us to walk this out and in our preaching, we can't just point back to Christ, but point now forward into the life of the Spirit, because in a sense, we can be just as moralistic, right? Pointing back, point forward towards how the Spirit enables us to walk this out. That was the hope of the prophets. Well, with that, I think we are going to finish off this lecture series. Mark, let me again say it has been a delight to have you. And uh, I would ask if the audience show your appreciation for his actions. Thank you. Thanks, Ben.